My name is Holly Stoneberg and I'm the Education Program Coordinator for Portage Park District. I'm joined tonight by the wonderful Becca Rohde. She's the Education Outreach Specialist and she volunteered to hang out with us tonight um, and she'll be handling the boxes. So just to talk a little bit about those, um, I hope you learn from me, but I want to learn just as much from you. So, um, oh, oh, Elvis decided to join. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I hope to learn from you too. So if you've already started your birding journey and you have tips or tricks that you want to share, go ahead and write them in the chat box so that everyone can see them. If you have questions that are specific to the program, you can put those in the Q&A box and Becca and I will handle those as well. Okay. Um, also, uh, did you want to say anything else about that, Becca? You cover. I was just going to say, yeah, if it's questions about the program, if you could try to keep them in the Q&A box, it's just easier for me to monitor. We have a really big group on tonight, so it, it'll be easier for me to keep track if questions go in the Q&A box and then any other comments go in the chat box. But I'll do my best to get to monitor both. Okay, thank you. So um, before we go too far ahead, um, I want to start by saying that tonight I do not mean to insult your intelligence, okay? When I name this birding for beginners, that's exactly what we mean, okay? So when I first started birding, I was with ornithologists and people that had been birding for 30 years, so it was really, really intimidating. So we're gonna start from the very beginning to try to alleviate some of those feelings for you guys so that you um, just get started with your best foot forward here and don't feel nervous about it, okay? Um, and again, if you have questions at all during it, just go ahead and share with us. Okay. So if you don't already receive our newsletter, I'm going to pause for just a second. You can see that our website is there, the same place you want to sign up for this webinar, but there's also a QR code if you want to scan it with your phone. And um, I really suggest if you don't already going and signing up to receive the newsletter, because that's our first source of information. Um, and I really like it because if you, um, well, if our programs have registration limits, the people on the newsletter will be the first ones to find out about that. So um, I'm going to talk for just a couple seconds. If you want to go ahead and sign up for that, um, now's a good time to do that. But in case you didn't already know, the mission of the Portage Park District is to conserve, ooh, my chair's breaking, um, Portage County's natural heritage and provide opportunities for its appreciation and um, enjoyment. Okay, so um, our Portage Park District, we manage over 2,700 acres and we have six open parks and three multi purpose trails. Um, our funding comes from a 10 year half mill levy, levy that was passed in 2014, as well as multiple grabs, gra oh, I'm losing my tongue, <laughs> multiple grants, and the support of the Portage Park Foundation. Okay, so hopefully I talked long enough for you to sign up for that newsletter and you could stay in touch with us in the future. I got them off the table, but Elvis is still around. The cat knows. <laughs> okay, so here's the first opportunity for you to communicate with us. So I put a very generic question on there, why bird? Um, and I have some answers for it, but I'm going to pause for a couple seconds so that you could put your answer in there. So why do you want to bird? Why do you think birding is important? You can interpret that question however you want. So go ahead and add that in the chat box so we can all read it. Why are we birding? We had some good ones, beauty and sounds. I like the, including the visual and the auditory there. Um, something new to do while you're hiking. So you're not just hiking, you're also getting to enjoy seeing birds. It's entertaining, absolutely relaxing and gets encourage us to get encourages us to get out in nature. Um, Jeff shared about just enjoying the birds in, in the backyard. They catch interest, um, encourage, I see a lot of make in, encouraging us to get out in nature, which is, a, a, there's always, it's always good to have reasons to get out, yeah. um, loving the birds and wanting to connect with them, learn about new species and new facts about all types of birds, national and state birds, oh. love it for fun and to be able to identify them. Like some people, see so yeah, some people like to know exactly what they're looking at. Exactly. A hierarchy of bird, I think meaning in like the food chain and stuff. And then want to know and recognize some of the birds. 
and then how see that how different birds differ from one another, which is awesome to point out because we do have a lot of variety in Portage County, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Those are all great answers. Thank you for sharing with us. I'm glad we can interact a little bit, even if we can't see you. Um, so the first one you guys got right off the bat, right? We are uh, connecting with nature. So ever since humans came to be, we felt this connection with nature and how uh, we belong there. E.O. Wilson, a famous biologist, um, has the idea of biophilia and how we love nature and we do feel this connection to it. And birding is a great way to keep that connection strong. Another one is to contribute to citizen science. So if you're not familiar with that topic, citizen science is a series of programs for people just like you and me who aren't trained scientists and maybe don't even have a degree in science. But um, once you contribute to the larger body of knowledge about either an ecosystem or a specific species or group of species, and there's a lot of citizen science programs around birds, and we'll talk about those a little bit later as well. You can meet new friends. So um, I don't know about you guys and how comfortable you feel, but whenever I see someone on a trail with binoculars, I'm going to walk up to them and ask them what they're looking at because I'm curious and it's a great way to meet people with like-minded interest, interests and see um, other things that you might not have been aware of if they weren't standing there before you got there. Um, it gets you moving. So I'll be honest with you, some of the birding walks that I've been on have been some of the slowest moving walks where we just amble along. But that's okay, because even if we're moving slow, it's still better than laying on the couch watching Netflix for three hours, right? You are moving. And another final reason that I came up with, we know there's more, but this is the list I came up with, is that it's accessible to lots of people. So you don't have to have um, a high level of mobility and, and able and to be able to bird, right? So I remember a few years ago, I was uh, sick. I think I had the flu, so I couldn't go to work and I couldn't do anything, but my bird feeders were conveniently full. Um, so I grabbed my tea and a blanket and I plopped myself on the couch with my binoculars and I was able to pass my day that way birding. So you don't need to be able to get around in, a, in order to enjoy this hobby, right? And then finally, uh, the sad facts are that um, we should bird because they're in danger, right? Um, a fact from Cornell says that bird populations are down 2.9 billion individuals since 1970. So um, although all of the biomes or the places where birds live are affected, one billion or approximately a third of those are from forests. And we know Ohio has a good deal of forests, so we're losing the birds that we're familiar with, right? And 90% of those, almost 2.5 billion of them, are from the families that we're watching all the time when we're doing this hobby anyway. So our sparrows and our blackbirds and our warblers and our finches are the ones that are decreasing. So I firmly believe that if you start to learn about something, then you'll start to appreciate it and then you'll care for it. So that's one of the reasons that I like to bird because I'm seeing these creatures and learning about them and that inspires me to want to protect them more. Okay. So, all right. Uh, again, I'm not here <laughs> to insult your intelligence, but we are starting from the bare bones, okay? So what are birds? I know you all know what birds are, but just so we have some things um, under our belt. They are warm-blooded, so they maintain homeostasis just like you and I. That's why we can still see birds out in cold days like today when we can't see things like the snakes and the lizards, okay? Um, they have feathers, which is one of the things that most of us like about the birds. Um, and yes, they have, um, they're pretty, but they all serve purposes, right? Yeah, they're to attract mates with their different colorations, but also um, they have different purposes as well. They can provide communication. So birds can actually make sounds with their feathers to communicate with other birds or to warn other organisms. Um, I know woodpeckers, their feathers on their tail act like bracing feathers. So when they're pecking at the wood, their tail feathers are holding them in place so they're not bobbing all over the place. And then things like penguins have um, tobogganing feathers on their chest and stomach so they can slide down the, the icy chutes that they go down. Okay. Uh, birds are also, um, we know they have beaks, but they have toothless beaks and lightweight skeletons and their skeletons are hollow and that allows them um, to have the ability of flight. So they've evolved in this way so that they can be lighter so that they are able to fly. Okay. 
the birds lay hard-shelled eggs. And if you're looking at the picture that I have here, I'm sure more than a few of us have um, indulged in those and enjoy those. Um, Becca has some fancy check-ins, right, Becca? <laughs> right. And uh, my favorite thing about birds is that they are our closest living relative to dinosaurs. Okay, so dinosaurs are pretty sweet. I know when um, Becca sends me pictures of her her chicken, she says, here are the dinosaurs, right? Because <laughs> um, if you look at the phylogenetic history of birds, um, they break off more recently than things like alligators. So yeah, alligators look a lot more like what we think dinosaurs look like, but evolutionarily, uh, chickens are um, closer related, okay? And let's talk about the class AVs, okay? So I need you to think back to your science class days and levels of organization for um, different organisms, okay? And we're gonna go through all of them, kingdom phylum class, but we're gonna play a little game, okay? I picked one specific bird and I'm gonna go through each level of organization. If you think you know which bird I'm saying, go ahead and put its common name in the chat box, okay? You ready to play my game? Okay, so first we're in the kingdom Animalia, right? And that's great, it tells us that it's an animal, but it's really, really broad. It doesn't give us any details because an animal can be us, we're in that kingdom. It could be a jellyfish, it could be a sea sponge, right? That doesn't tell us anything too specific. If we go down to phylum, we're in chordata, and all that means is that it had a backbone during some point of its development, right? Again, helpful, but not too specific. And here we go to the class Aves, which is really helpful, right? So now we know we're talking about birds. You can see that form of the word talk or sounds like avian or aviary, right? It's all that same root word. And this is where we branch off. So birds are in the class Aves, but we're in the class Mammalia. So now we see a little bit of differences, right? So in the order Passeriformes, and Passeriformes just tells us that they are perching. So their feet have developed in such a way where they can sit on branches, okay? Is anyone starting to guess yet? No guesses yet. They, this group's too smart. They know they want more clues. They want more clues? They want, yeah, they want more clues. Okay. You, guess, you guys ready to start with guessing perching birds yet? No, look there. Look at them. No, nope. sorry. <laughs> they're right. like, no, we want more. I'll, I'll give you some more. Okay. What about if I tell you they're in the family Corvidae? Oh, does that it's strike any bells? Anything? No guesses yet. What about the genus Corvus? So you might have heard of Corvids before, right? And then finally, we go down to our species, which is Brachyrhynchus. Oh, people are oh, guessing. Thank correct. you. Mary's right. So <laughs> Brevirancos just means a uh, short snout or bill. And those last two give us our specific epithet or our scientific name. So the scientific name for this organism is a Corvus brachyrhynchos, right? And the only reason I put this in here is because as you start to bird and as you start to use um, crackle, cool, guesses are coming in, but as you start to use these um, field guides, they'll include the scientific name. So again, we're starting from the beginning. And now you know, if you see something that's in a funny Latin word, that helps you talk about a specific bird, right? Because I might call it a northern cardinal, Becca might call it a red bird, but we're talking about the same bird. So a scientific name helps us um, figure out exactly what bird we're talking about. Okay, thank you for those of you that are guessing. Ready for the answer? It is American Crow. Good job, Mary. Nice job. Okay. So now we've talked about um, birds. We need our tools of the trade. And I'm going to start by saying that you don't need anything if you don't want, okay? If you're standing and looking out your kitchen window at the birds in your yard, you're already doing it, okay? So you don't need to spend any money in order to enjoy this hobby, okay? So um, that being said, if you do want some tools, the two things you'll need are binoculars and guidebooks, okay? So when you go and look up um, 
binoculars. There's going to be tons of guides online that help you figure out what is best for you, right? Of course, nothing replaces, go, replaces going and actually touching them and seeing how it feels in your hand, but there are guides to help you figure that out if you want to purchase something online. There is an Audubon article, and if you're familiar with birding at all, Audubon is a big name in, in it, um, but he has um, lots of, or they have lots of articles on uh, binoculars. And the one that they suggest is seven by 42. So the seven is like the magnification of it. So you're seeing it seven times bigger than with the naked eye. And 42 is how big the lens is. Okay. Um, and this is the recommended one. And when we go down here and talk about Sibley and Peterson, that's the set of binoculars that they were using when they wrote these books. Okay. Um, and when you get into binoculars, you don't have to break the bank. I think my very first pair cost around $60. Um, so it felt um, pretty feasible to get into it. You can spend less than that or you can spend more. I wouldn't spend so little like a kid's pair. That's not going to get you very far. In fact, it kind of even looks like he might be using them backwards. Does it look like that to you, Becca? <laughs> it's kind of... Actually, it kind of does. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, you have options, right? When I was doing some research, I saw that Swarovski, you know, the people that make crystals, um, they make binoculars, but those are going to run you about $3,000. So I don't know about you, but I don't have $3,000 to drop on binoculars. So do whatever fits in your budget and what you're comfortable with. And the other tool that you'll need are guidebooks. So I put some pretty standard names up here in the birding world. We have Kaufman, Sibley, Peterson, and I think Takiela. I think that's how you say his name. Um, it, but they're all great. It just depends on what's good for you. So I say that because a book is only good if you're going to use it. That's true for any tool, right? So if you... Um, um, go and buy a book, but you open it and you're intimidated by it, you're not going to learn from it. So I suggest going to your local bookstore, looking at these, looking at others that they have, and finding one that you are interested in, interested in and feel like looking from so that you can actually learn from it, right? Holly, can I um, add real quick? Go ahead. Uh, if when you guys come birding with us at the park, we do have a Sibley uh, field guide that you guys can borrow. So you can actually test it out and see if it's one that works for you. If you, you know, if you enjoy the pictures um, and then we, we also provide some of the ODNR field guides too. So you can test it out at the parks. Thank you. Yeah. So um, those will be available when we go birding together. Becca, I did just forward you an email for someone who might be having issues if you want to look at that. Thank you. And then the other one that I added in here, the Ohio Division of Natural Resources puts out their own set of field guides, not just for birds, um, but for lots of different things. So um, I have the bird one. Well, that's kind of hard to see. There it is. You know, the little cardinal on it. But these have the birds of Ohio in them. They come with CDs, uh, but I like them because you can go right to ODNR's website and download them. Okay. But they have them for birds. They have them for um different kinds of birds, so waterfowl and warblers, but then things like lizards and snakes and spiders and all those things too. So those are fun to check out. Okay. <clears throat> so you have your binoculars, you have your field guides, but we live in a techie world, so we should probably add some technology to this as well. And I've added some helpful apps here for you to look at, okay? Um, first of all, these are all free, so you don't have to spend any money on these. I just put some that I use pretty regularly. When I say regularly, I use the Merlin Bird ID app every single day, okay? Um, and that might, might be a little intense if you're not a huge bird nerd, but this one I find really, really useful. I like it for two reasons. First of all, it's because... Um, the, it has a click through bird identification feature, right? So it'll ask you, I think about six questions, like the location, the size of the bird, the color of the bird, what is it doing? Is it swimming or is it in the brush? And then it'll give you a list of birds common to your area to help you ID what you're looking at. The other feature that I really like is the sound ID. So if you hit that feature and hold up your phone, of course, you have to think about how clear is the sound and if you have any background sound as well, but it'll give you um, the identification for the bird making the sound in real time. So I like that one because I can be just be standing out in the front yard waiting for the dog to use the bathroom and be practicing my bird identification. 
Okay. And I like that tool because I really do practice with it. I'll hold it up and I'll try to guess what bird is making the call and then I'll check myself with the app. So that's a good way to test yourself as well. Um, eBird is really good for lists. Becca actually introduced this to me. So we had our Christmas bird count on New Year's Eve. We went out, like she was saying before, in the rain. Um, but this allowed us to keep our list of birds that we were seeing as we go through. And I know for me personally, I'm trying to count all of the birds that I see throughout the year. So um, as I see one, I'll add it to my list. And then I have a running total of all the species that I'm seeing throughout the year. And then finally, we have the Audubon Bird Guide. Again, a really big name in birding. Um, this one's good. Yes, it does have a, a click-through identification guide. I find it a little bit clunkier than the Merlin Bird ID app. But um, what I really like about this one is it has the, the field guide right in the app. So you can go and look up birds while you're in the field. So I highly suggest the field guides, but sometimes um, books can be kind of intimidating, especially if you're not used to them, but apps we're all used to, and it's easy to click a couple buttons and have it help us identify. And then once you have the bird, you can go back and read about the bird in your book later. Okay. Were there any other apps that you know of? Um, I think for birds, those are, those are probably the best. You can also use iNaturalist, um, right. but it, you won't get an immediate identification. And um, these are, these are pretty much targeted towards bird ID. So, and they're free. Free is always good, guys. <laughs> okay. So when we talk about birding and all hobbies, really, there are ethics that come along with it. So if you look online, there's a couple different variations of this, and there's even some excuse me, some organizations that have adopted formal ethics, but these are the three that you'll see kind of repeatedly. So above all, respect the birds and its habitat. So we already talked about our reasons why we want the bird, like our respect for nature and the peace it brings us, but that only works if we're respecting the birds and leaving them at peace. So you remember you're in their habitat and you want to observe them acting naturally. So if you're upsetting them, or making them feel unsafe, then that kind of defeats the purpose. So make sure that you keep a safe distance and the birds um, hardly even know you're there, right? Again, we want to respect other birders. So I talked in the beginning about how I was with ornithologists and people who had been birding for 30 years. So I was intimidating, intimidated, but that's not because of how they were treating me. They were really helpful and they were patient and they were answering my questions. So it's important for all of us to treat others the same. So um, if someone asks a question that you're like, well, oh, why don't you know that, right? We don't say that to people. You have to be willing to answer their questions and help learn so that more people can help us protect the birds. Um, and then respect other people and their property. Uh, believe it or not, not everybody is interested in birds. And if you're trying to see an owl on somebody's property at two o'clock in the morning, they might not be so happy with you. So um, <laughs> you just have to take that into account, right? The bird might be really rare and it might be really cool, but if you're trespassing, then that's not, <laughs> that's not okay. But owls, I know, I know, I agree. That's what- the, Even if it's the, an the owl, yeah. Yeah. even if it's an owl. Even if it's an owl. <laughs> And then finally, this isn't one of the top birding ethics, but it's something I think that's important to share is that we want to minimize the use of recordings when we're attracting our birds, right? So yes, these apps that I showed you before do make the calls. And a lot of our feathered friends are really curious, but if we're bringing them in, right, then we're kind of crossing a boundary where we want to keep that human and animal distance, okay? so. Um, and it sounds silly, but you don't know what you're saying to that bird. Because a lot of birds, their calls and their songs can be territorial, right? And you might be sending the message that there's someone in their territory that what they don't want there. So again, we're trying to respect the birds and not upset them in any way. Um, there is a way that you can attract birds without doing this or using their recordings. And it's called pishing, right? So... Um, it's like saying shh at a library, but with a P at the front. So it sounds like psh, 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 psh. And that's a funny enough sound to bring the birds around so that you might be able to observe them. So that's one way that's usually accepted by birders. 
Okay. When we talk about birding, what I love about it is that you can do it all year long. Okay, so my kayak right now is sitting in my garage collecting dust because I'm not going to use it in the middle of January, but I can take my binoculars out and bird whenever I want to, right? Um, but you'll see different birds if you go at different times. So when we talk about sunrise to mid-morning, that's usually when we're listening for our songbirds. So they've slept all night and they wake up hungry just like you and me, so they're going to go out and sing and find food and build their nests and um, just live their best little birdie life. But that's when we're going to hear the majority of our songbirds. And when it starts to get hot in the middle of the day, then they're going to calm down a little bit. But around noontime um, is a good time to look for our birds of prey. So I don't know if you've noticed when you're driving on the highway, all of the, the hawks and the birds of prey are sitting there. And especially in the summer, the vultures take advantage of those changes in air temperature. And that's what allows them to soar. Okay, and then obviously in the evening is when we're looking for our nocturnal birds. And here I have a picture of our um, barred owl, right? And I like him because I don't like staying up late, but he's gracious enough to come um, call a little bit earlier. And then he even stays up sometimes later into the morning, right? And then if we look for seasonal changes as well. So winter, in my opinion, is the best time to start birding. One, because there's no foliage. So it's really easy to find those birds, right? It gets a lot harder when there's leaves on the tree. But also um, the clear, crisp winter air um, makes their songs clearer. So really right now you're doing the right thing to get started in winter, okay? Um, but also winter is a good time for our migrants that come from the north. So you might be seeing dark-eyed juncos come in or a little bit later in the season, we'll start looking for snowy owls, which are beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll see some. Um, spring, of course, is when everybody is mating, right? And that's when they're using all their calls to find their um, potential mates and then bring on the next generation of birds for us to look. And it's a, um, a really good time, specifically in northern Ohio, for the warblers. Um, I know when we went to um, Berlin Lake, right, I saw at least two dozen new species that I hadn't seen anymore and, or before just because of that um, spring migration. Uh, in summer is when our songbirds, they've done mating, right? They're, they're young or getting ready to leave. So they start molting. So they're not um, calling anymore because they're in kind of a precarious situation. But it is a good time for something like purple martins. And I don't know if you've ever been out to Nemesil Reservoir in, um, around August is when they start their migration and they'll come in the thousands. So that's a cool thing to see. And then again, fall, well, if you look up, there's lots of birds flying over star migrations. So yeah, it's a, whenever you want to go, if it's during the day or during the year, right, you're bound to see something. So let's differentiate between songs and calls. And yes, there is a difference, right? Our songs are those distinct vocalizations that the birds make, not only to um, attract a female, some, well, sometimes females call too, but um, also to say, hey, buddy, this is my territory. You need to leave, right? So they're kind of establishing their area and where they're going to get food and where they're going to find mates as well. The calls are the short, simple sounds that we hear, just like the bird chirps, right? And when you're listening for these different things, that's when we listen for pitch and quality and rhythm because they really are musical little creatures, right? When we talk about pitch, maybe it starts low and it goes high and maybe it does the opposite. It starts high and it goes low, right? Different birds are gonna call in different note patterns. The quality, is it really buzzy or is it a clear tone? right? So robins are really pretty singers, but there's also a, a, a red rose-breasted um, grosbeak, which is an even prettier singer, right? But they cut sign, they sound kind of the same. And then when we talk about rhythms, these are going to be different for different kinds of birds. Um, a lot of them in Ohio, luckily for us new birders, say their names. So um, what are some good ones, Becca? The um, Chickadee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so chickadees, um, they say chickadee dee dee dee, right? We have Phoebes and we have Peewees and they all say what their name is. So they're, they're trying to help us out, right? Okay. Okay. 
So when we talk about bird feeders, this is definitely a personal preference kind of thing. Not everybody is for bird feeding, right? Because it thinks we're making, um, or they think we're making it a little bit too easy for the birds and a little too self-reliant on humans, but it's really up to you, okay? Um, that being said, there are some things to help us uh, feed the birds effectively and correctly. correctly. First of all, pick the right location, right? So um, birds feed at all different levels. So depending on what kind of bird you want to attract, you can put it at different places. Also, it's important to think about um, if you want it by a window, right? Um, yes, it would be cool to see those birds up close, but if you put it by a window, that also increases the chances of a window strike, and we don't want that to happen. Okay? Remember, we're trying to be safe with the birds. And also, um, think about if you have any stray cats or outdoor cats in your neighborhood, because um, cats are public enemy number one for our songbirds. So think about where you're putting your feeders when, if you have cats in the area, right? We also want to provide a variety of seed. If you want to see lots of different birds, put out lots of different seeds. So now we're pretty lucky they, they put out these mixes that'll bring in different species. But you can even go farther from that. If you put out um, the black sunflower seeds, then you're going to get lots of chickadees. If you put peanuts, then you're going to get the blue jays. Right? So you can just do your research and decide what you want to put out. Um, and then uh, the other thing is suet, right? So suet is essentially fat with seeds on it. And that would be good now, right? Because that helps them um, get more energy, but that might not be so great in summertime when you're, when it's melting and um, that fat can actually get on their feathers and make it hard for them to fly and clean themselves. But also dripping fat attracts things that aren't birds, right? So we don't want that around. And then um, you want to clean it periodically, just like you wash your dishes. This is what they're eating off of. So if you have a feeder like the one in the bottom left corner, that's good because if the bird decides to go to the bathroom, it'll fall right off, but it's still eating from it like a plate. So there could be um, fungus or mold or just bacteria on there that we want to get rid of so that they're not getting sick from our feeders. Okay. So let's talk about where to bird. Again, we said if you're in your own yard, you're already doing it, but Portage Park District has lots of different places for you to go check out the birds. And we do have lots of areas, but I put my top three um, because um, I have the most luck here with seeing lots of different types of birds. So Berlin Lake Trail, Trail Lake Park, and Towner's Woods are all wonderful areas to go see different birds. You can see we have um, bald eagles at a couple of them, um, different wood ducks, um, and then of course all of our songbirds. But these three specifically are great because they have everything a bird wants. They have water, they have shelter, and they have different food sources. So these are all great areas to go see different birds. What do you think, Becca? Did I miss anything on there? Berlin Lake Trail is the number one birding site in Portage County. Oh so um, we have the highest number of individually observed species at Berlin Lake Trail in Portage County. So good job. Good job, birders over there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with Holly that these are all great places to see a variety of birds. You'll see bald eagles at all three of these parks. Um, and yeah, we definitely want to keep keep the birding numbers up at Berlin Trail because we like staying number one over a neighboring state park. I won't throw anyone under the bus. Um, and then we also just recently opened a bunting trail at Dix Park. Um, and in the summer, we do have a, a typically have a pair of indigo buntings who nest near where that trail crosses the farm trail. So Dix Park is another great spot. But Holly will take you to a couple places as you guys come out birding with us this summer, spring and summer. Yep, we'll visit them all. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go back to our games. I have five birds here that if you go out any day in Ohio, you're going to see them, okay? Again, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but we are starting from the beginning, so we're going to start with the birds that you'll see pretty commonly so that we can have five under our belt right away. So I'll kind of describe it, but I'm going to try to play their sounds too. Okay. So, can you hear that? Yep. All right, are they naming that bird? Yeah, go ahead and try to name this bird. Which one do you see? 
put it you in the chat. All, you all know this beautiful bird. <laughs> right away, Laura got cardinal. Good. So we know this is um, the state bird of Ohio. Um, I have two males here. I should have put a female because they are different, but we recognize him by his red crest, his bright red feathers, his black mask, and his orange beak, right? Good. So we know that's the cardinal. I think female sometimes is pretty, but people, a little drab. Sorry. I think sometimes people are surprised at how pretty their call is too. Like that's, I just think that's beautiful. I yeah, think. they are. They agree. All right. Put this one in the chat box. Are you going to play this now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Blue Jay, they're probably bossing everybody around at your feeder. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty unmistakable when they yell at you in the woods too, so. <laughs> so we've all heard this sound, right? So that's kind of another one that says its name, Holly. Yeah. Jay. Kind of. So it will definitely say blue JJ, blue JJ, right? But he's our bluebird, right? Well, not the bluebird, but a bluebird that we have here. And they're they're definitely bossy, right? They even are known to imitate hawks that come around. So they'll make the hawk call, all the birds will scatter, and then they'll fly in to get that bird seed, right? I just think that's great. That's a that's a good move. It's a good tactic. Yeah, they're yeah. smart. All right. And someone said this was their favorite before. Yeah, a couple of people. This is a, I believe this picture is from Trail Lake Park too, I think, because this is a day Lisa came out with this. Yep, Samantha was on it. That's our chickadee. Good job, Sam. So again, he's saying his name. If you're not hearing the, the bird sounds, make sure you turn your volume up a little bit. Oh, Jeff just said his cat is loving this. <laughs> is he is he watching the bird presentation to uh to learn something? That's yeah. great. <laughs> so again, he does say his name, Chickadee Dee Dee, but he also has that last call where um, in my opinion, he's saying sweetheart, right? And that's kind of their their attracted call for when they're trying to find love. So I think it's kind of sweet. <laughs> they're saying sweetheart. Okay. On to number four. What's that guy? Everybody check that belly out. Good job, Laura. That's our Robin. So they have that beautiful call in what most people describe as the stereotypical bird sound, right? When you think of bird sounds, that's what they are. Um, and they are really early callers. They've even been given the name, um, the dawn chorus, because when you wake up and go outside, you can hear them, right? But yeah, you can see their red breast and that white ring around his eye. All right, last one. I think, Sam, did you say you love this one? <laughs> yep she got it too good morning dub good job guys yeah so notice chris's spelling on that it's not morning as an am it's morning as in kind of sad and you could tell their song is a little melancholy and they're not morning because i can hear them singing all day long even when the sun is setting right? yeah Andrea made a good point that some people think that's an owl when they hear it. So um, that'd be a good one to practice is listen to some owl calls and then listen to the dove so you can hear the difference. Definitely. Holly, we had a really good question um, when we were talking about the robin. So Marcia was asking about um, why, if they're, if they're hibernating right now. Um, can, you tell, can you tell us what robins are doing this winter? So Goose just shook all over. Oh no, sorry. What robins are doing? Yeah, what are our robins doing in the winter? So um, I, don't, I don't know if she means all birds or robins specifically, but. Uh, no, so our birds generally aren't hibernators. They either um, hunker down or skedaddle, right? And robins are, they kind of do both, right? So we know that some of them who don't want to deal with it will go, but we have some robins that stay as well. So it depends on how hardy they are. 
Do if, they can, okay. yeah, if they can find food, they're going to be sticking around. So they don't migrate. Um, but if they need to go to, you know, a little bit for, further south than Portage County to find food, they'll do that. Um, but they, they aren't going to be as pretty as they are in that early spring photo, right? Their, their feathers aren't as vibrant because Holly told us they're not looking for love right now. They're just surviving. Um, right. So robins are around. All of the species that Holly just featured are going to be around all winter. So they're good. They're good birds to look for over the winter. And they are, they're doing what we're doing. They are toughening it out, toughening winter out, right? Um, Jeff just said, uh, do you find if you repeat the chickadee sounds with your mouth, not an actual recording, the chickadee will almost carry on a conversation with you? It doesn't sound crazy because that's true, right? I know if I'm walking into my house from outside and they're calling, I don't know what it is. I'll just call back, right? So I'll say chickadee dee dee and then we'll have that little conversation. So yeah, you're not crazy. I've noticed it too. Good. <laughs> Chickadees are really social too. So that's why they're one of the common birds that you'll see when um, parks do like the bird in hand and they'll feed birds because they um, they like that interaction. They like to go and get a snack and chat. And Yeah, they do. They are social, right? Especially those chickadees and the tit mice and the um, nut hatches, right? They really want to know what's going on. But so hopefully those five, a lot of you got all of them, right? And I wanted to show you that even if you consider yourself a new birder or a novice, you already know something, okay? So with the more practice um, and the more patience, right? You'll get even more, but here's five that we're gonna see pretty regularly. Okay, so where do we go next? Of course you have this new hobby, but we don't stop. We are lifelong learners, right? Excuse me. So it's important to get connected and learn more. So here are a few resources for you to look into. The National Audubon Society, they um, have this beautiful website where his um, drawings are up right now. And I think I could spend hours looking at those pictures. Have you checked them out yet? I was actually just up at the Cleveland Natural History Museum and got to see the display up there recently. So they don't have a ton of artwork up there. Don't go running if you all only want to see bird pictures, but they do have some of the original drawings up. It's kind of cool. And they're beautiful, right? Um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is another big wig in the birding world. Um, so they, remember we talked about before citizen science, they have two going on right now or soon. One is Project Feeder Watch, and that's just you watch the birds coming to your feeder. Um, it's already started, but you could still join. It's through April. I think that one costs $18, but they send you a, a calendar and a poster, but then you just tell them what birds you're seeing in your yard and you're contributing to scientific knowledge, right? Another one is the great excuse me, backyard bird count. And that's just for one weekend coming up. So mark your calendars, February 17th through the 20th. Um, and that one is free. Uh, do you remember that, that app I talked about, the Merlin Bird ID app? As long as you're on there IDing birds, you're already contributing to their project. So that's a really simple one to get involved with. And of course, there's social media, right? We know there's Facebook groups for everything. So if you look up Ohio birder groups or Portage County birding groups, right? There, there's a bunch. So there's easy ways for you to get involved. Cool. Okay. So um, was this okay, Becca? <laughs> no, I asked you, but. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so <laughs> you can learn with us too. So this isn't part of the beginner birder series, but Becca and I are going to have a webinar specifically on red tail hawks on Thursday, February 9th at 7 p.m., just like this. Um, and that's another push for you to sign up for the um, uh, the newsletter, right? Because then you'll you'll see when that comes out and then you could sign up and get on the list for that. Okay, so come hang out with us again. And drum roll, please, introducing the Birding for Beginners kickoff hike. So yeah, we can sit here and we could talk about it on Zoom, but the best way to learn is by doing. So um, we're going to start hiking together in what we hope becomes um, a Portage Park District Birding Club, right? So on Saturday, February 25th, I think we said eight in the morning. I didn't put the time on here, but eight in the morning um, at Trail Lake Park in Streetsboro. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure we said 8 a.m. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it's not on the website yet. So you guys sign up for that newsletter. So you um, get notified first and then um, you'll be you'll be able to go to the things to do page and sign up this week. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good. So again, we hope that this becomes a series so that we can continue to um, 
get better at birding together. Okay. So we hope to see all of you at that. You do not have to have binoculars if you guys come birding with us. If you're not ready to make the purchase yet, like Holly mentioned, we do provide um, binoculars when you come birding with us. We'll have some field guides. Um, and like Holly said, it'll be an inclusive environment for however, wherever you are in your birding journey. Whether you are a novice or whether you just want to go birding, right? We could use some experts in the group too. So feel free to join us. And we've made it to the Q&A session of it. So um, I'm asking for two types of questions, either about questions you had about today's program, right? Or topics that you'd like to see covered in the future. Do you want to learn about bird anatomy? Do you want to learn about a species specifically or Ohio species? So um, I'm going to stop talking and just wait for you to ask questions. But I really want to say thank you to everyone that came tonight. Again, my name is Holly Stoneberg. If you have any questions later on, my email is there at the bottom. But thank you. This was fun. Marcia said thanks, and Leslie hopes you feel better. <laughs> oh, could you tell? <laughs> oh, no. It was not too obvious, but I'm it, sorry. Thank we you, think Leslie. we'll send you some tea. <laughs> And Kathy said she enjoyed it. Thank you all great. so much. Holly, you did a really good job. That oh, was great. Thank you. More than like local learn. state birds. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mary. I hope Jeff's cat enjoyed the presentation. Yes. <laughs> Jeff's cat was the main target audience. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Thank you all. No questions. They're just excited. They're right. excited to come birding. Oh, Jess is going to send a picture. I, can't, <laughs> I cannot wait. Please email a picture. Migrating Terry birds. wants to talk about migrating birds. That's a really good one, Terry. And we do have some hikes planned for when the warbler birds come migrating back north. So we will go looking for warblers this spring. They can be a tricky group. I am not savvy with uh, warblers, but we will tackle it together. Yeah. Okay. More wants a uh, sparrow ID. How to better ID a new bird. Sparrow ID is a great job. Good idea. Um, There's a store in Chardon for birds. Yeah, Lori, tell us the name of the store if you find it. I think I know what you're, is it, the, they have bird feeders and stuff. Um, and then Kathy had a request for a presentation on just a couple species so we could learn more. That's a good idea just to feature a few at a time, Kathy. I like that idea. Because yeah. if you tried to do all the warblers or all the sparrows at once, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie said so many little brown birds. What are they? <laughs> that's exactly what they are, Natalie. <laughs> little brown birds. Yep. So that's relates back to the sparrows. Yep. So many. And then birding by birding by song, birding by ear is a great point. There's a lot of people who are really skilled at that. Um I like the way you featured songs tonight too, Holly. So we can we could even do just a song birding by ear day. You have to go out blindfolded for that birding session. <laughs> yeah. True, true quizzing. Are birds likely to use birdhouses over winter? I think that depends on the species, but they do, right? Do you know which? Yeah, and I guess that's that would be a good question to know exactly which species. I know the the house sparrows around my house are still in actively using the birdhouse, but they're not nesting in it, you know, as far as creating a nest to reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're using it for a shelter, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, for the birds in Chardon. Okay, we're gonna have to check that out. And then Andrea wants to know if we will do a Merlin app hike so we can practice sounds, which is a great idea. We are, um, yeah. Actually, we're in, the, in talks about doing um, a lot of nature tech, um, but Merlin is definitely on the list. What are the most common birds seen in different seasons? Okay. Is that a right now question or is that a top? <laughs> is that a topic? <laughs> um, um, and I just, Lori's, the store in Chardon is called For the Birds. I have heard of that, Lori. Um, they have they have different type of houses that are species specific, she said. And then they, they, I think they have um, feed feeders and stuff. Samantha's is a question for right now, she said. Okay. Um, so right now, just speaking from my yard, um, cardinals every day, morning doves, blue jays, hawks. There was a hawk in my yard this morning that I didn't even see until he started to fly. Oh, he was, he was very well camouflaged. We have a really great picture from a volunteer who lives in Ravenna, close to the hike and bike trail, who had a hawk come and get a cardinal from his feet. Oh, no. He got a picture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Samantha, we're also getting really close to, so like the very beginning of spring, what we all still think of as winter, 
Um, some of the waterfowl are going to start migrating already, and a lot of those raptors will actually start mating too. So mm -hmm. as we as we shift seasons here, there's there's going to be a migration that's going to be coming back up. The um, <laughs> warblers and a whole bunch of other species are going to be coming back. Yeah. Kathy said house sparrows everywhere. Yeah, Andrea brought up... Um, we were in a meeting at Morgan Operations Center and um, we were both facing glass doors. And during the meeting, a red tail hawk came and swooped as if it was going to hit the glass and then changed direction real quick. And both of us were like, whoa, <laughs> it was um, a little intense. If yeah. she said, um, if the doors were open, they would have landed right on the park director's shoulder. It was, <laughs> it was a big bird. Um, do you have any tips for Lori on how to keep grackles out of bluebird houses? Uh, <laughs> grackles are right, yeah. So it's I have mine are the house sparrows, Lori, that are going into mine. And I know there's other species that'll go in too and remove the bluebird babies if they want the nest. Um I don't know that I have any tips to keep them out. Um they, there are some some folks feel differently about the, the measures to take to remove other birds from a bluebird house. Um, but if you want to protect it just for bluebirds, you know, you could remove the competing species nest and then hope the bluebirds move back in. Um, but it's hard. It's hard. It's not it's not easy. I, there there are um, different standards for where how the height of the bluebird house and the direction that it's facing and what habitat it's near. So just make sure that you're following the recommendations for that. I think Audubon Society has some good ones. Okay. What was the Morgan Ops hawk? Was it a red tail? Yeah. We also we have American kestrels that hang out near there sometimes. So. Um, I don't see anything in the Q&A box. Thank you, Natalie. 